This episode of Finding Demo Surf Fishing is being brought to you by DS Custom Tackle. DSCustomTackle.com, the Delaware boys, gotta love them. They're doing great things up there, and it's not just for Delaware. The equipment that they sell and produce is great used worldwide. Floats, got you covered. Beads, got you covered. Teasers, done, easy, no problem. Rigs, yeah, all day, whatever you need, they got it. If you're a rig maker and you're looking to get supplied, they actually do wholesale. So reach out to them, DS Custom Tackle, and you're going to be able to find out all that good information. If you have a custom request, you can still send that in too and see if maybe they can hook you up. They do a lot of really good things, and I'm very, very fortunate to be on their team. I really enjoy that. So DSCustomTackle.com is the website. Go take a look at it. Welcome back to the show, everybody. And this week we are taking the digital road trip international. That's right. We're finally going back to Australia and I have been dying to get back out there. We had a great episode last time with Go Fish Australia. Lots of cool knowledge was shared and it's just, you know, it's on so many people's bucket lists here in the continental United States. Well, hell the world, let's be honest. And I don't know how I got so lucky, but I ended up finding finding this gentleman that i'm bringing on here it's uh peter with pete's cultural adventures you're gonna have all the links back on finding demo it's gonna be on all the social media platforms all his stuff is gonna be labeled back for you to take a look at he's got a lot and with that also it's not just knowledge he's sharing it's passion it's fun it's exciting it's a whole lot of cool things and if you're going over there and you want to go get somebody to put you on fish yeah, he's got you covered, and not just a little. I'm not going to ruin it. I'm just going to let him talk about it, man. I'm just, I'm excited. I really am, as you can see. Uh, so without further ado, me flap my jibs. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm uh, very excited to be on the show and honored and to share my story about my adventures and the amazing barra fishing. I love I mean, saltwater fishing is great. It's If you get into this sport, everyone knows that if you're into it already, it's a great addiction. It's lovely. It's great. There's so many fun things. And you can go international and catch a whole bunch of different species. But the funny one is, uh, and I've run into this a couple of times when I'm talking to someone from Australia, if they've seen my clips or any of my pictures, I talk about in Florida, hey, I'm catching whiting. And somebody in Australia will be like, that's not a whiting. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, hold up. Your whiting is a lot different than my whiting. We've got a whole different thing. But uh, pre-show, we were talking about barramundi. Beautiful fish, but a powerhouse monster of fish. So cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, they they got a lot of fight on them. I reckon barra fishing is an amazing sport. Well, you talked about some hand lining, and we're going to get into that. Once you when you saw, talked about getting a finger cut and hand lining being hooked forever. So I was like, all right, I'm in. Nah, that's this something I got to do. So let's go ahead and get right into the questions. Let's start at the very beginning. We'll work our way all the way through it here. Tell us your story and what got you into fishing. So, um, yeah, my name is Peter Griffiths. I'm actually fan and operator of Pete's Cultural Adventures. Um, yeah, so I was working for Warringari Arts at one stage and as a tour guide and then you know this year i just wanted to venture off and do my own thing um because i wanted to take people out on country share more experience cultural knowledge and just give them what i feel on a daily basis on the spirits that hang around me and you know hopefully brush it off to some of our guests and take them out on country do a bit of barra fishing and i teach them also um Bush Tucker and Bush Medicine, the seasons, and how our ancestors uh, lived throughout so many years um, through being out on country. So that's something that a lot of people, and I, I, this was brought up to me before, and that's something that I definitely am glad you're bringing up now and you're bringing it up early. The knowledge that's been shared with you for years, especially out in the bush, 
because that that's that's different world. You're on the east coast of Australia, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, top end of Western Australia. Oh, Western. Okay, for some reason I thought it was Eastern. Um, when I was learning about the east coast uh up in the north the northeast territory uh i was very quickly instructed that yeah hey that's not the place you go with a kayak alone you know that's that's up country you don't go there and then i started hearing more and more about you no know, the bush fishing is totally different and then hearing you talk about that all the things that you've learned from all these years you put that in and you teach your customers that you do that is that correct yeah so um I teach my customers about living out bush. Um, if they're broken down, for instance, and I'll, I'll show them a thing or two on how to look for water, um, the trees to look for water, if they've got a throw net. So a throw net is a cast net, and they get to their bait as well. Um, not only their bait, if they're lucky enough, they can catch a little barrel or a good-sized big mullet. Um, yeah, and like the teaching skills that I teach my guests, they tend to take it away and they love it. So I teach them as much as I can for as long as I can and I'll keep thriving and keep doing what I do. Well, that's got to be a lot of fun. And for people to be able to get that experience and take it home with them, I mean, that's life-changing, man. That, that's that's huge. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, the people that I do take out, you know, and they give me the best feedback ever. And sometimes I get emotional and tend to have a tear or two dropping. Um, but the best thing about it is the fact that I put, I let them jump in my shoes when we catch enough, uh, more than enough barriers. You know, we go out to all the old people in town. I let my guests give the old people and the feelings from their heart, my guests, just lifts because they see the old people happy, especially when they see my car coming around the corner. They know they're getting a barrel today. <laughs> so what you just said right there, you, so even if you're overcatching, you're giving the catches back into the community. Is that correct? Yes. So um, here in Kananara, all, all around Australia pretty much. So there's elders um, that are unfortunate, too fragile for, for medical reasons. And, you know, they have people that can't take them out because they don't have a four-wheel drive and such things as, such as that. Um, yeah, and I, I want to fulfil all that and try and give back to the community, give to the elders because if it wasn't for our elders, the trauma and the heartache they went through back in the day, you know, they're still here today and we wouldn't be here today, all us young mob. So we're... Very lucky that our old people are still here with us today. Some has passed, yes, but they're still here. The other ones are still here. And the old people that has passed, they're still here in my heart, and they always will be. Dude, that's so cool that you bring in the community. It, it just hammers home how good that is out there. And you being such a part of that and helping the community, that's huge, man. Congratulations and well done on you. Good on you. Thank you. So we started talking about the story and what got you there. So let, let's back that one in. What got you into fishing? So um, I guess it kind of runs in my blood. Um, there's a young fella. Like, that's all I knew pretty much. Now. Um, the generations, when I was in this young generation, um, my dad, he's passed away now, but, you know, my dad's family's always gone out bush, always gone out fishing. And so is my mother's family. And, you know, yeah, fishing has just been something that I've done all my life. And I love my fishing. My whole family loves fishing. And I want to teach the skills that I have. So I'm doing it the best way I can. And, yeah. Okay. Well, easy, easy peasy right there, man. With good layup and good start. Uh, what is your favorite thing about fishing, though? My favorite thing about fishing the, the burns that I get on my hand. So the hand lines, they rip off, and that's when there's a bit of burn, and it just makes me, gives me the adrenaline to try and get another burn. Or, um, But my partner, she tends to put some salt on there, so she, when she doesn't want to do any more fishing, then we'll have to head home, and that stings a lot. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well played indeed right there. So you just mentioned it. So your primary fishing, do you are you primarily hand lining for fishing or are you using equipment? What do you use there? I just use hand line, no sinker and the hook. Um, and live bait. So live bait, the mullet that we catch, uh, that we'll just hook him up through the tail, throw him out, let him swim around, act panic because the barras, they, they will sense that there's mullet or there's fish panicking and bang, fish on, got a good size barra. Wow. So when you're doing the hand lining, are you using a uh, plastic spool as a kind of as a barrier piece? How, how do you do your hand line? So hand lines, um, what I do is I grab out the reel, so the reels and the hand lines, and yeah, I don't, I don't worry about the sinker. I just put the hook, hook straight on, hook the, uh, the mullet on, throw him out, bang, and then just wait patiently because not all fishing is quick. It's all about patience and about having a good time on country or at bush. Okay. Makes a lot of sense right there. Uh, so can you share a memorable story of fishing, including any kind of unexpected catches or challenging fishing situations that you ran into? Uh, yeah, actually I can. Um, so about two and a half years ago, I went out Keep River. That's where I take my guests. And I was just bored. So I was like, oh, this is boring. I'm not going to go to this spot. So I went to the next spot. Five minutes later, I went to the next spot. And then as I was coming back after the day was finished, as I was coming back, I seen a few families sitting in the first spot that I was at and the second spot. And it, it upset me that the fact that they've caught 12 within half an hour. So oh. I was like, oh, I was just here. So I think that day was the bad luck day for me. But the most amazing day was when I caught a metre meter 30. And that was a struggle. 30 minutes just to pull up because I had to tire them out. My line wasn't so um, big and tough. It was just a medium-sized line. And oh, pulled him up, pulled him up, and I just wanted to tire him out, tire him out. Once I tired him out, I went, let him sit on the bank bit uh, where the water is because there's an actual bank where I have to lift him up, but I didn't want to lift him up because the line might snap. So what I did was quickly put my line down, ran back to the car, which was uh, 10, 15 metres away from me, grabbed my throw net straight over. And I was like, you're not going anywhere. You're coming home because I am very, very hungry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so a metre 30, that's a big fish. That, that, that yeah. is not tiny. And it was close to Christmas as well that day. So oh. I was like, yes. Super weird. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet it was delicious. Oh, definitely. It went perfect on the coals. <laughs> well done, sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that that hurts when you go to see somebody catching in your last spot. That 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 that'll tickle your soul in a not good way. That'll make you mad. Yeah, definitely. So I looked at that, I was like, Well, that means not my day today if they're catching everything that where I was. But see, we with that, we believe in um, old people, country saying, look, you had enough fishing. You know, today you're not getting enough fish. Go home, rest up, or go and sit down, have a couple of days rest, stuff like that. Um, yeah, because reincarnation is what my ancestors believed in. So, and that's what I believe in as well. And you know, all them barramundis and Crocodile, salt water, fresh water. You know, we I believe in that there's an old person or there's a little spirit in those. I love that. I mean, people. The nicest way I can say this is I can hope that that's the thing, because it would you know it, it doesn't hurt my feelings to know that that's a possibility. Mm. That's I mean, unfortunately for me, I'd probably come back as a catfish for a couple of rounds for paying for past transgressions in my life. But, you know, at least I'd still be in the water. So there, there is that. Yeah. But I love that. That's such a great thought. And I love that belief. That's really nice. Yeah. 
Mm. All right. So let's get into the knowledge piece here from you. How do you plan your own personal fishing trips? Um, so what I do is I have a look at the tides or the Keep River is tidal and all the other places around Kananara is not. Uh, Kananara is, a, is, a, is fresh water. Keep River is salt water and fresh water. So there's a spot there that I take people to show them how the salt water, fresh water mix up. Um, but, yeah, once, the, once that tide comes up a bit, I'll go over there and have a look for those rock pools and uh, the big pools there that's always got barriers. Um, yeah, so I, I'd check the tides on Key River because that runs out to the ocean. As for in town, I just go when it's nice and hot because when it's hot, barriers too, do tend to come out. As for the night fishing side of things, I like to go when the full moon is up. Uh, me and my partner, we, we go out all the time when it's full moon and it's we, we never miss. It's all, all hit and no miss. Oh, man. I haven't had a good full moon day, so that's, that's reassuring to hear that it works out there. And right now, I mean, for us, we're, what, December? <clears throat> we're about to be December. So we're dead middle of, we're about to be in the middle of our winter. You all are starting your summer runs. So the heat is really starting to pick up there for you now. So the bear, so the bear is, is this like becoming the hot time for you for them? Or is this a better, when's the best time for you for those? Um, well, we're coming into the wet now. So the rain should be here probably next week. Um, first week of December is always when it starts raining up until March. So it rains so long, but that never stops a keen fishermen like myself. Um, there's other people around town that loves their fishing, and I've already made a track out to Keep River, which is dodging the black soil. So what black soil is is that mud. Once it gets wet, you sink, diff out everything. Um, yeah, and I've I'm worked my way around that one so that I would never. Because I, I just love my fishing. I just, it's just in my blood. <laughs> I can see that. So, okay, so you've, I didn't realize that. So you have a three-month season of wet season. And this mud, yeah. so you, you've built yourself a trail so that way you can avoid it to still be able to get to your fishing, to continue on with what you have been doing, to keep your skills, and also feeding the community and yourself and the family. You've done a lot of prep work for this. Yeah, that uh, trail that I've made, I only made that last week. So <laughs> fingers crossed when it does start raining that it works. Uh, I'll be having someone come out with me just in case with recovery gear. Smart. And I'll, I'll, I'll be happy with that one, yeah. So with that, is that part – well, I, I no, that's not the right question. Um, knowing this then, so you know you're coming into the wet season, you created a path, you created the trail, you know where you're going to fish all the time. And with the adventures that you have been doing, is this something that people will learn from you as you go when you're talking about going out there into the wilderness when you're doing these sorts of things for that kind of fishing? Yeah, so um, when we were out there, I teach bush medicine. Bush medicine was one of the things that, you know, we believe in and it still works till this day. And, you know, it's, it's survival when you're out bush, no matter where you are. I, I know this this bushland good, but it's always survival for me as well. There's crocodiles, there's you know snakes, there's other venomous things out there. And fortunately for me, I grew up knowing about bush medicine through my grandmother, my grandfather, all my old people, and I, I'll pass that knowledge on to our guests and also to the younger generation, um, all our nephews, nieces, all of them, our families that don't know. And, yeah, and so you also got bush tucker. So we look at the seasons and I'll, I'll tell them, oh, this season here is perfect for if you want some vitamins like boab nuts, they're actually really good. And they, I think they're 20 oranges in one. So the vitamins are real good in that. And our Mirawong name for that is Guruwun. So I tend to teach the language as well when I introduce bush, bush medicine and bush tucker. Wow. 
Okay, so you've got a full handful here. That is... Sorry about the technical difficulty there, folks. That was on me. So the this whole piece, you're causing me a little change in my normal p- pattern here of podcasting, which is great because I like to be a little out of the box. I'm for that. But you have basically changed my way of thinking of how I was going to approach this because you really spend the majority of your time with these adventures. I mean, it is a venture for you all the time. You're going out into the country to go out and fish and you're tapping into old resources of knowledge and you're passing it on to the people in your, like you said before, you're, you're passing it down. So you're taking all the old knowledge that you've been giving, sharing, changing it, and then making it better and then passing it on to the next one while teaching survival for the next, for everyone around you. Is that about correct? Did I sum that up right? Yeah. So um, the survival side of things, yeah, that's all correct. And it's something that I like to do because, you know, you can never be too safe or too okay on country. You might think you might know everything, even I don't know everything, um, but I've learned really good on it being crop wise. That's the main thing. Um, and yeah, like I said, you know, people think they know all about survival and all of this and all of that, but unfortunately they don't because there's something that people are learning every day. Even I'm learning till this day. Yeah, constant knowledge and learning is key in life. I mean, the moment you're not learning is the moment you end up dead. Uh, I had a very fortunate meeting in my life. We had a a royal, uh, an Australian army officer transfer over with us in the military. I think she's got the stuff. Um, He came over into America and while now he's in the Marine Corps, we both shared a deployment together. And one of the things he always made a great joke about is he's like, man, I'll tell you, everything in Australia wants to kill you. You have to be a pair. You have to pay attention. Yeah, that's, that's definite, um, especially with venomous snakes. There's scorpions here as well, centipedes, millipedes, spiders, crocs, sharks, everything. <laughs> everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, y'all, y'all, got, y'all like to live dangerously over there. That's, <laughs> you've got the right species for all that stuff. <laughs> um, well, this, <laughs> yeah, this is a like, this is the perfect time. We're actually going to knock into our bay check. We're 22 minutes in. So let's go ahead and get our first bay check of the episode taken care of here. This bay check is being brought to you by Kids Can Fish. Head on over to the website, kidscanfish.net, and take a look at all the great things that they're doing. Here you can see through the website. They've got all the information right here. They are a state and federally recognized 501c3 charitable foundation. All the camps and clinics all get funded back in to the organization to help these kids go out and go fish. If you also want information on the running of the Bulls tournament, it'll be updated right here up on top. And if you want to learn more about the entire team, you can take a look at the pro staff links and learn all about Caroline, their partners, how to get in touch with them, and the photo gallery is always great. If you'd like to help them further, you can do one more. You can go over to Promar Ahi and take a look at that website, and you can buy into the CastNet. This is the specialized one. This is the one that you hear a lot about. Caroline has talked a lot about it, and a per a portion of the proceeds go back into Kids Can Fish. They have the three foot, the four foot, and the five foot. All these things are great, and it all again, it all goes back into the Kids Can Fish Foundation to help these kids continue to do great things with these camps. Keep your ears open because there's going to be a lot more things coming from them. It's always great and always great to be a part of it. Yeah, Caroline is great with that cast net, and yeah, it's every time I see that little thing, I always think that she's one of the few people that blows my mind every time she throws a cast net. She gets a perfect pancake. She gets it out there every time I throw it. It's it's a banana taco. It's a very narrow. So I suck with cast nets. Um, you you opened up with it. You, I, I, you like using cast nets. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so cast nets are actually all really handy. Um, I've I've got an easy way instead of bunging my shoulder out. So when I have my guests, and I buy a whole heap of cast nets, sizing from six all the way up to twelve foot. And that's because there's some small people that come on tour, also kids that want to learn, all the way up to big, tall giants. I'm just a little in the middle short fella myself, but I'll stick to my 10-foot 
for that least. I know that I can do a neat circle with that, get a lot of bait, throw out a line. Yeah, I'm not that good. I will work on it. It's on my it's on my list for 2024 is to be able to throw a cast net properly. But for I can imagine like you talking about it, I could see how it'd be very important for you, especially live lining like you're doing with the hand lines and, and that stuff. So yeah, that that's I, I love that you're taking that out there with your customers and you know teaching people how to use them. It's it's such a good skill to have out there, especially out when you're close in. If you want. Sometimes you just need a little fish to survive. You don't need the monster. You just need a little guy. Yeah. So those little guys actually catch the monsters. Yeah, um, exactly. It's all chain. <laughs> yeah. um, whenever you're in Australia again in 2024 or whenever, feel free to come over to Kananara and I'll definitely teach you how to throw a net. Oh, yeah, like I need another reason not to come to Australia. I'm in, dude. I am totally in. I cannot <laughs> wait to come over there. Your country is one that is, it's always been impressive to me. Anyone I've met from there has been kind, friendly. Uh, the Any of the anglers I've talked to have always said great things about the fishing. And it's just, there, there's so many great things that I've heard and read about with your country. And it's just, it's on the list that has to happen. So, Yes, it will eventually happen, and I look forward to that. I will hook you. I will find you, and we will go. Yeah, definitely. Okay. I can guarantee you a pair. Oh, oh, yes. Sold. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> All right. So we talked about going into the bush. You're talking about the medicine and how that one works. Um, I believe you're going to get one of the nuts or the, in the, your hand line here. We'll see that in a little bit. So with the path that you've created now, you have that for the wet season. What other things and factors are you planning with your adventures when you're going to go out into the bush and go fish? Um, well, I want to, I'm going to ask some of my old people how they fish without bait. And that would be an interesting factor to teach on my tools as well. Cause I've been taught a couple of things already like grasshoppers, um, some sea snail thingies and fig, you know, the fig trees, the fig nuts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they, even those were good for uh, brim. We call them black brim. And I, when I was showed that, I was like, what? So, yeah, I tend to use that more than chicken heart now. So, yeah. Oh, you were using chicken heart. Yeah, the brims, they are crazy for the chicken heart. Chicken heart and corn. Oh, I've heard of corn. I've heard corn is one of the, that is a naughty hidden bait that's so good. Yeah. So I love this. Now you're talking into another piece. So you've been able to take into what nature's providing you. Oh. Hello? Uh, yeah, I got you now. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the international. Sorry, uh these are fun um so i love what you were talking about with that though because you now you're taking what nature and you're throwing it on to make another catch that's really i mean that's fun have you done that much um not that much uh i guess because i've actually organized the elders day out for the 19th so i'm giving them all the fish catfish uh barramundis and brims and so I'm going to be doing that because the 19th of December is when they, when I've organised it for all the old, old people. That's at the place called um, Juniper. And Juniper looks after all the residential old people and has a hostel for them. So I want to take them out of there. Let them come out on country. You know, that's, that's what they want. Nice. That's going to be a great trip. I'm looking forward to seeing about that. Oh, that ties in nicely. So how did Pete's Cultural Adventures come about? So Pete's Cultural Adventures, I had a um, cultural adventure all in my head and I was thinking what, what else should I do, what else should I name it? I had a few things up in the air running and then I seen my best mate's father. Uh, he sang out to me, says, Pete, and I was like, you know, you're a legend, old fella. He, just, he doesn't even know it, but he saved, he made the name Pete's Cultural Adventures. Okay, so that's how the name came about. So what is it exactly? So 
Pete's cultural adventures because uh, my father has passed away and he's Peter, so I'm junior, he's senior. And we have cultural rules and regulations that we have to abide by here in Kununurra and also around Australia for the Aboriginal people that our ancestors put in and we have to abide by them. So my partner, for instance, she's not allowed to say my name because that's my father's name. So she calls me Sebastian, which is my other last name. And then you've got all my sisters. They can't say my name. They either call me Sebastian or they'll call me something different or even initial. And that, that's, the, that's vice versa for my sister. And also with my partner's mums or aunties, I'm not allowed to say their name, look at them. I have to give them a big space. And, yeah, that's, just, that's vice versa for my partner and my uncles. Okay. So, I mean, cultural things, you, you're living that. I mean, that is your culture. You are living that all the way through. Okay. So, the piece there. So, now with the social media that you're doing, because, I mean, you're starting that. You've been doing guiding trips. You're doing social media. You're bringing people in to learn about your culture and with those pieces. Is that – that's correct, right? Yeah. So, even like, for instance, my guests, they ask why my partner says Sebastian instead of Peter. And she tells them, and we, we teach them as well. We still have these cultural practices to this day, which is very rare and rich in some um, cultures around Australia. And yeah, the further up you go, I guess, the stronger the law and culture. Interesting. Very interesting. So, I mean, you're sharing, I don't want to call it the behind the scenes, but you're sharing your life. And what the Aboriginal way is, you, you're you're educating people that come through as you're guiding them through their fun trip. But anyway, but you're guiding them on everything that you've learned, how you are, how the people are, how the people communicate. All these pieces, you're showing all that together. Is that right? Yeah. So I teach them as much as I can and as much as I'm allowed to. There's yes, that certain part. Things, yeah. <laughs> that, I'm glad you said that. I'm like. There's something missing from this, and I know you have to say it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a definite. So, yeah, um, there's certain things I can teach, certain things I can't. Uh, there's women's business and there's men's business. And also, even with the men's business, there's certain limits that I can say and that I'm not allowed to say. And that's all the things that I was taught as a young fella. And I tend to pass that on and let people know, look, you know, the reason why we do this like this is because – our culture says so, and we have to abide by it. It's like, it's like the police officer or the justice system. They tell you to move on. You have to move on. As for us, mob, we move on when it's when that area is not don't belong to us, and that's the woman's side. We have to go over to the men's side. Okay, some major cultural differences. All right. There you go. And you're teaching. And that's, that's, I mean, that's huge. I love it. So with that one there then, okay. So you, you, you I'm going to backtrack a little bit to catch back up. So you got very much so into fishing with your father. Uh, it's been a part of your culture. You've learned that one. You've been passing it on as you ran there. And then I don't think I asked this question. So this is where I'm going with this. What got you to decide? All right. I'm going to do this. I'm going to become a guide. I'm going to take people out. I'm going to show them this way. If people are coming down here, this is what I'm going to do. What got you into that? So it was all talk at first. And I just went out fishing and I just enjoyed it. I took friends out. I took a, a huge group out last year camping just before I started the business. And I was like, what? You know, I could... I could do this for a living because I love my country. I love being out here. Getting paid to see people smile, learn, and also to be on country. Oh, man, that's, that's the best. And the rates, my rates are literally very competitive compared to anyone else. They're very low because I'm not in it for the money. I'm in it to teach and also to see the smiles and also to get another big barrier. It's all about the bear. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So how have the experiences passed down from the Aboriginal tribes, from, from everything from the culture? How have those experiences passed down to you played a factor in how you guide? 
Um, that's a tough question. That one, it's, I guess, it kind of runs in my blood. Like knowing what I do is right and knowing how to do it, I guess. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it's in my blood. All right, I like it. So with them, you, you mentioned the barramundi, of course, and we, we've talked about that one. What are some other fish species that, if you're taking clients out, that they can target? What other things are you looking to take them out to catch? Um, so we have thread fin salmon, which are really nice. And then you get the blue nose salmon out there. Uh, we, we catch sharks and stingrays as well. But we tend to chuck them back because, yeah, I don't really like looking at them. And we definitely, definitely caught a couple of crocs, but I snapped the line before <laughs> I bring them up because they're really big and salt water. Uh, no, I'm not a fan of the water <laughs> dinosaur. <laughs> I've, I've said that so many times on this show. I mean, living in Florida, yeah, we've got plenty of alligators. Y'all are a different level with crocodiles, man. Y'all, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's her. Yeah, no. Alligators, you can tap them on the nose. Saltwater crocs. If you try to tap them on the nose, then say your last words. Yeah, you didn't need that arm, apparently. <laughs> 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 no, no. Water dinosaurs are to be left alone. They can have that. They can enjoy their little thing. I'm good up here. So, you, what are some key techniques or tactics that you like to teach their client, your clients, because you're doing hand lining, you're not doing rod and reel, you're doing it the old fashioned, you're doing it the old school way. Uh, what is it you can teach them to enchance, uh, to increase their chances of success during the charter? All right. So I've got one of the hand lines here next to me. And these hooks are pretty much my favorite ones. So, oh, a little so, leftover scale there, huh? Yeah, by the looks of it, we went out fishing last <laughs> night. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll teach them how to hook the, the bait onto this. Unfortunately, I don't have any bait here. But That's all right. We know where you're I got. I got where you're going. So the tail part, so in between the back fin of that mullet and the tail, I tend to look for that bone, digging straight through. Even though it'll be a bit hard, but just push, 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 and then bang. So once that happens, we I'll show them how to throw out an hand line. So I always tell them keep it up front and swing out. But as for the beginners, I tend to tell them put your hook on the hook and bait on the ground, let a lot of line out, and then throw it out because that there helps out a lot. I tend to help them throw it out a lot of the time, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, they're there to learn. They're not pros. They want to learn the old school hand lines. Um, and also teach them once that barra starts biting. So once the barra, I'll put it where my shirt is so that it's black and you can see the white line. So you'll, you'll see the barra actually biting like that. And then where's this white, white. And once they take it a bit longer and then it starts pulling out, hook him and try to grab, his, grab him by the gill with that, bang, you get yourself a barra. <laughs> and your your hand is the drag. You're the one controlling the whole thing. So, I mean, that, that's, that is all you versus beast. Yeah, definitely. So with that as well, we always lose barras because they spit it out. But when they swim up onto the surface, when they jump up, when you got them on the hand line, try and not to leave too much tension, but just try to keep the tension going, 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 pull him up, and then you got yourself a barra. If you don't catch a barra, that's the one that got away. <laughs> it's the one that'll haunt you forever is what it is. <laughs> Break your dreams. <laughs> So when you're yeah. doing hand lining, then you're doing all the controlling. When you're doing the reel in, you're pulling the fish in while you do that. Do you do the using the reel, the hand line as the basically you're walking the reel in, or are you grabbing by hand wrap, hand wrap? Um, so yeah, you could do either which one, but my favorite style is 
leaving the ha the hand line on the ground and just pulling them straight in like that. Oh, yes, okay. Sir. So yeah, so you're just pulling the line itself. Okay, I see where you're at. Wow. All right, that explains the cut on your thumb now. <laughs> um, you'll see in one of my videos that I actually pull up a barrier and I'm just free balling with the the line. So I don't believe in pulling them up like that. Sometimes I do when I have too much um, burn marks on my finger, then I'll have no other choice. <laughs> <laughs> then you're in the necessity i understand oh boy um well it's actually perfect so let's go ahead and knock out our second bait check of the episode we got a lot more to talk about with this because it's now we're getting into the fun stuff it's getting good yeah this bait check is being brought to you by the sinker guy y'all know i love it Go over to thesinkerguy.com and take a look at everything that Chip's got going on in the Sinker Guy garage. Lots of fun stuff in this website, y'all. I mean, you can get lost in it, really. If you go take a look, you just uh, get right to the homepage here. It's got a little couple of things to talk about, but we go into the good stuff, get into the garage and into the shop. Need sinkers? It's in his name. It's got you covered there. The Bruno rig, the Uno rig, and the fishing mortician rig. We all love those. But if you need other supporting gear, he's got you covered with that. Bait, floats, oh, fishing line so many different things any kind of other supporting gear there's a lot on the website so again go over to the sinkerguy.com take a look get your order in today extremely fast shipping superb customer service and chip's going to make sure you're taken care of every time that's just how he does it sinkerguy.com get your order in today so when you're doing the handline piece and you got it all down on the ground uh i guess oh i forgot to ask you what pound test do you like to utilize when utilizing handlines um, I'd probably go with 50 off, oh, yeah, 50 plus, sometimes 40 plus, and it all depends on your skill, I guess. If you're getting a thinner line, it's all about tiring him out. If you tie the barrel out, let him run with it, who cares? Let him run with it as long as you, you feel him hooked. Let him run, tire him out because barrels are not. They're, they're very strong, don't get me wrong with that one. They like to snap lines, as we learned last night. Um, but they will get tired if, if they're hooked correctly. Keep pulling them in, pulling them in. Once you get them up to the wherever you can grab them, straight through the gill underneath his um, mouth part and hold him, bring him up. So I don't use no hooks. Uh, what they call it, the fish the hooks. Gaff. You pull up. Yeah, gaff, that's the word. The gaff and the fishing net, I don't use any of that. I just like to hands on all the way around. Uh, you, and I like what you just said there. You know, you can either do it one of two ways. You can go heavy line and be like, come on, you ain't going anywhere. You pull them up, get them in, and get them out. Or you can do the finesse fishing <laughs> and let them run and tire them down. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And I like that you threw in there too. It depends on your skill level because I mean, you can. Uh, God, I'm trying not to alienate people when I say this. It's not a bad thing that you have to use big line. If you're fishing after a species that's not leader shy, it doesn't matter. Go for it. You can haul them in and get them out. You know you're fine. But if you know you're, you're having to get into the finesse fishing, you got to pay attention to what you're doing. You're not. You're not gonna. You, you can catch a 300 pound fish on two pound test. You can. Um, it just takes a ton of skill. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Okay, so we've utilized the hand line, and the hand line is your primary, and then you're also out with the cast net. That's your secondary, using that for bait, and then you've already explained how to use with the hooks. Okay, cool, and you're teaching that all along the way, along with also teaching survival, medicine, making trails, essentially how to live and survive in the bush, which is huge. I can't argue that this is zombie apocalypse happiness for me. We could talk about that like for an hours and hours um but let's talk about the other part now we started talking a little bit about it and let's talk about the relationship piece how do you cultivate positive relationships with clients and tailor the experience to their interests and goals so i have bespoke itineraries so that means two of the requests so beforehand i try i, I, I like to ask them <clears throat> sorry i like to ask them what would they like to learn today and where would they like to do, and what would they like to do? Barra fishing, fishing on country has been the favourite by far, and that's 
requested 98 times, 98 out of 100 this year. And the other 2%, they want to stargazing. Stargazing or rock art. So I've done that as well. And stargazing added a bit of um, night fishing into that stargazing one. So just to top it off for them. And I try to go beyond their expectations so that they could feel more welcomed into this beautiful um, country of ours. And next time they come through, they'll be looking me up. Oh, I love how this bloke went out of his way for us. Let's go and jump on another tour. Oh, I'm sure that people would love coming back. I know I would. I'd be like, yeah, we're going again. What advice or recommendations do you provide to your clients to prepare for a fishing trip? All right. So <clears throat> fishing trips, free clothing, the free clothing, sorry. Uh, bring. <laughs> right, we bring like, hmm, <laughs> where are we going with this one, bud? <laughs> <laughs> oh, nah. Um, yeah, just clothing suitable for the bushwear. Uh, not jeans much or anything like that. Um, just stuff so that they can breathe. Shoes, if if needed, because some some of the guests uh, they don't like to get their feet dirty or mud between their toes. And then bring a smile, a camera, and I'll cover the rest. So I cover the food. I cover the the hand lines nets everything except for their smiles their camera and their clothes they bring their own clothes <laughs> perfect so you've got them all covered up all the other all, all the other ancillary things for fishing they need to bring themselves a smile and a positive mental at, positive mental attitude and it's going to be yes. a good trip yeah. uh well you already nailed that one then so what are how can listeners find more of the information about your adventures and get in touch with you to book their experience? So um, Micromedia down south is actually should be doing my website within the next couple of weeks and that will be um, yeah, that, that will be peachculturaladventures.com.au and also Facebook under Peach Cultural Adventures. And I also have Instagram, and I have recently just started my YouTube channel. Got two videos on there, but it's a slow developing thing. And yeah, I'm just well. I just want to grow and hopefully reach out to a lot more people. Oh, you definitely will, Peter. That's n that's not even a slight possible like. A a wish that's going to happen. You're doing great things. And I love that Warrington has been doing some fun stuff. I've been seeing what they've been doing with their media. I've, I've been watching those pieces and getting the tags and I'm like, man, they're doing really cool. So I look forward to seeing all the stuff that grows with that. And again, everybody, everything will be linked back on the podcast page for this episode. It'll be on finding demo surf fishing. It'll also be wherever you found this, whether it was Facebook, Insta, Tiki talk, uh, or whatever podcast player you're listening from. And it will also be on YouTube as well. So the tag back, will be there uh what have been some from valuable lessons learned after starting and running this venture um valuable lessons i guess that i don't know every question i guess because i was asked questions that were a bit oh what, what? I, I don't know that question i'll have to talk to some of my old people to to find that one out and it's a good thing because the questions that do hit me that i don't know makes me committed and determined to find that answer and i only go through my counsel which is my old people so that's been the most difficult thing for me i guess Okay. I can see how that would be. I mean, like you talked about earlier, you know, there are cultural requirements. There are certain things that are lines in the sand that can't be crossed. There are certain things that can't be done and that's just how it is with the culture. Got it. No problem. Totally understand that. Now I'm, I'm okay. I totally get that. There are going to be people that obviously don't understand that and can't really wrap their head around it. And you're obviously teaching them, which is great because this is something that you're moving with. So that moves me into the social media aspect of this. 
you are you're sharing on YouTube. You're growing on that one. You're growing through these the podcast here. <laughs> this one episode. This will be the first of many that I know you will do throughout your entire span, and I'm very excited to see how those go for you. What has no or knowing that there are lines that you cannot cross, and there's certain pieces with that that you are sharing. What made you want to start becoming a content creator to share that experience? Um, well, I, I was a tour guide before I jumped on done my own ventures, and I've seen how there's been a lot of questions about you know the old days, and I teach and le- learn as well was while I was a tour guide, and. The experience I give people, I guess, is there's, there's the old people, right? The retirees, they haven't learned any of that in school, any of the um, the, uh, the punishment that our ancestors had to go through. So they did not know anything, no history, no Aboriginal history, no First Nations custodians, nothing. Until I, not only me, but other tour guys in Australia, you know, we, we teach them Aboriginal history and they did not know, know about that because in school they wasn't taught that. And now that they retired and they want to, the majority wants to learn and gets very emotional when we tell the stories and the stories that our old people tell us and that we pass down as well. And that, that makes them very emotional. It's like I'm very knowledgeable around this as well. Like there's a few things around town here that are named after like a few streets that are named after very evil people. And I made a petition for one of them and I'm hoping to get that changed because it's just very hurtful and disgusting to have a name, a street name such as that. And yeah, I'm not, I've got no word for that one. Well, I can tell. It's all good. You're welcome to be as open here, man. I'm not, like I said, I'm not a censoring person. I mean, I'm really not. The only way I'll censor somebody if it's something like, okay, you know that you are about to get completely demolished for this. Then I might tone it off to help you. So that way we both don't get railroaded. But no, I mean, I totally understand what what you're saying, especially that. Because I know nothing. uh, I I will happily say this because it's true. I know nothing uh, except for highlights and wave tops of Aboriginal history. I really don't. I, I know that there is a lot of things that have not been good in the history and you all have been through quite the run of it. Um, that's again, as an American wall cross a pond, that's not something I know about and I would never even think to say, Oh yeah, I totally can relate to that. Cause I can't, but I love that you are opening up about it with social media and you are willing to say, look, this is what's happened here. And you're sharing the stories, the ones that haven't been shared. Now, my question to you is, is that something that's going to be a focus with your social media presence? Or is that going to just be a happenstance growth every now and again, you'll talk about it? Um, Well, Aboriginal history is, is, I talk about that always on my tours. And when I have people around, even when I'm just going to the shop, I sit down, have my lunch, whatever. I've got some people that come sit down, hello, here you going? And I just tend to spin a yarn, even on the plane when I'm flying. Talk about Aboriginal history to everyone, let everybody know the stories. Uh, when I go out to Keep Rivers where I take my guests, that road, there's actually a road there that's heading out that way as well. It's called Weaver Plains Road, and that was actually named after two brothers, Jimmy and William Weaver. So in the 1920s, they actually slaughtered 40-plus um, Mirong, Gadjarong people, Aboriginal people here in Kananara. And they first they shot them and then burnt their bodies. The ones that didn't die from their gunshot wounds actually burnt alive. And they were all chained at the same time. Yes. I explained stuff like that. And that's very hurtful towards our old people. Okay, so you're giving the real history then. Okay, so yeah, you're you're not holding back. It's all right. I can got it tracking. All right, so that's what's going to be on there as well. So you're going to share the knowledge and those pieces, along with the education pieces of, of how you do fishing, why you do fishing, and your charters, all those. So you're going a full encompassing uh, on what your social media is going to be. Is that correct? Yes, and 
you know, like my rates are quite cheap, it's 300 bucks Australian dollars for a full day on country, learning about history, culture, fishing, wow. everything. And that is amazing price compared to anywhere else, I guess. So I'm not trying to be the big hero or anything, but it's not about money. It's about sharing culture, history, and just being in country again. And your time is worth it, man. I mean, you're giving a class. You're educating. That that educators get paid. Sorry, not sorry. I'm saying educators get paid. So, yeah, no, yeah. you're good, brother. You're good. Okay. Um, let's see here. So, you've just been starting on the that one. And you've been doing social media for a while now. I've, I've been following you. I've been tracking and, and watching and learning and seeing how that you're posting. Um, and I appreciate the tags because it gives me like, oh, hey, what did Peter do today? You know, it's fun to go back and see stuff when my brain is in about a thousand different directions because it is one o'clock in the morning here and I'm just coming off work. So for me, it's like, oh, cool. It's something to learn about, you know, when you're over there. You're with the social media piece and the sharing one. What is something you're really looking forward to utilizing social media and YouTube for? Um, I guess, in a way, help for promotional side of things. Uh, and to get my story out there, I guess, to let people know that I'm teaching history and I want others to learn. And, yeah, like, and I guess, in a sense, I'm looking also to put myself out to the probably draw some sponsors in for myself so that I could, you know, upgrade my hand lines or upgrade my fishing gear and try different things. Yeah, and like uh, from here onwards, I just want to keep trying and trying and do my best. So you mentioned a company down south. Are you working with another company? Um, that's Waytop, Western Australian Indigenous Tourism Operators Council. So Don Monk, and he's one of my mentors. So he's, they actually um, they support me quite a lot, and I, I love the support that they give me. And also Auntie Rosanna Angus, she's from Ulan Islands Tours, and um, yeah, they they've she's my mentor, sorry, and yeah, they, they've helped me out quite a lot financially for flying over to Perth to do things or broom and learning more things on how to make my business healthy. So I love that you brought up a keyword and I want to mention it. Mentors. How is how important has it been for you to have a mentor through this? Uh, it's, it's very important, I guess, because without a mentor, it's hard to, to get through things, I guess. Um, I started my business pretty much on my back. So I just took a few people out here and there, and I didn't have a car at the time, so you know, I'd, I'd have to hire a car or I'd jump in with them, take them out country. And, yeah, and I think Don Monk actually reached out to me, I think probably – a month and a half into my business and he's been an amazing bloke and so is Sonny Rosanna. That's so good, man. Yeah. Too many people in this, in our game don't have a mentor. Um, I didn't and until I finally got one and I realized, man, I'm all messed up. And then mentor helped me kind of get my game back on and we figure out what I was doing right, what I was doing wrong and how to do it better. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's hard without a mentor. It's hard. Well, it's great. And, you know, it sounds like you've got quite that one. you got the group down south. You have the elders there. You have the youngins there that can also help you with all the other pieces with social. You know, you, you've, you've got quite the support network, it sounds like. Yeah, well, I'm very surprised on how, how much people reached out to me in a way and also how much I've reached out and my voice was finally heard. Um so next year, actually, I'll be trying to get some of these young fellas in town here who are in trouble from the justice system to come out on country with me with one of my tours, you know, uh, 
throw the front and get some bait for our guests or carry the bucket and we'll get some bait. You know, just to take them out of town and hopefully one day I can be their mentor when they want to start something similar to what I've started. Nice. Growing. I love it, man. That's doing so many good things. You're passing it on, and that's that's huge. Absolutely huge. All right, so let's do the last bait check of the episode, and we'll get you the closing questions, and we'll get you out of here so you can have the rest of your evening because I know it's coming up on nighttime for you there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This bait check is being brought to you by Ninja Tackle. You guys know I absolutely love Ninja Tackle. I love all the rods and all the gear that I ever get from there. It's always phenomenal and top notch. Now, right here, you got to talk about it. The old little bummy. That's right. Bama Beach Bums Littler Rod. The little bummy is a nine foot six rod. Hearing a lot of great things about this. It's been doing really well in the surf and a couple other instant or other places you can use it. If you go over to the website, ninjatackleva.com, as you can see, plenty of great things on the website. The Ninja Dagger, Ninja Dagger series, the Beach Bum, uh, the Bummy Stick, the 12 foot, which you guys know, I love my 12 foot. I love my 12 foot. The nine footer is phenomenal. There's really nothing bad, but if you need rigs, he's got you covered. He got you with ES lures and other hand tied rigs, hooks, other gear. He's got it all through here. As you can see, 15 pages worth of stuff, sand spikes and bait, all good things all the way through. If you're into the firearm and tactical side, oh, he's got you covered there. Ninja Tactical, lots of good pieces of gear in here. As you scroll through, you're going to find something you need. I know it. Always good stuff. NinjaTackleVA.com. That's the website. Go on over. Get your order in today. So you've been doing this. We've nailed a lot of really good things. Um, and one of the ones I'd like to do with the closing questions here. So let's talk about some advice for beginners that are looking to get into hand lining, but we're not going to go into the bush because they, that's, that's a hands-on experience. We're not going to talk about that on the podcast. I don't want anybody going out in the woods thinking, you know what you're doing. No, go out with somebody, make sure you don't die. But advice for beginners with hand lighting. Uh, what what advice would you recommend to somebody that's just starting out that wants to learn? All right. So the best advice I'd say, um, buy some gloves, you know, the thick, not thick, sorry, the thin waterproof gloves. Having that because you're going to burn your fingers no matter what, even when you're trying to cast them out, sometimes they tend to slip and then burn your finger. So I'd, I'd recommend gloves. I'd also recommend having a buddy as well to help you to watch you when you're throwing crop wise, anything bear wise. Um, uh, having a buddy, yeah, having a buddy and gloves. Oof. Yeah, it's the best best idea. That's the best thing I can do. Hey, you gave something that's better than nothing. So, yes, hand line goes, buddy, important. Okay. All right, I'll ask you the last question. We'll get you out of here for the night. What's next for you? Um, well, 2024, I want to continue to thrive. I want to make my old people proud, my father and my grandfather up in heaven. I want I want them smiling down at me. And I just want to keep thriving with my business and sharing my stories getting it out there for people to hear. Um, come on to my adventure and see me grow. Perfection. Absolute perfection. I love it. Well, Peter, you have been phenomenal. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us. Thank you for sharing a bit of your culture, your history, how you're doing things, what you're doing, and what the future brings for you. Thank you so much for all of that. I, I truly do appreciate it, man. I really do. Nah, thank you, brother. I'm very honored for coming on on your show today. And yeah, it's my first time I'm actually doing something like this. So I was a bit <laughs> nervous most of the time. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. You did well. All right. Well, it's been great. We'll definitely talk again soon. Thank you again. And uh, you take care, man. Thank you. You guys too. I, I love it. And keep your lines strong. That's it right there. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Hope you had a good time because I did. That was a good trip down to Australia. Hope you got some good knowledge out of that. And there's going to be a lot of cool things coming from Peter. I really do believe so. So all the social media things will be linked back on Finding Demo Surf Fishing. It will be linked to all the podcast stuff, and you'll be able to see that. And have, If you have questions, you're welcome to reach out to him. He'll have it all in there. We'll have his contact information there so you can reach out and uh, do good things. You've been listening to Finding Demo Surf Fishing. It's been fun seeing you. I'm out of here.